In this Debaco University video, I'm going to go over some of the specifics of looking at microbial analysis uh, of cannabis plant material, which is an important test to look at. Here, you're going to learn about the details. All right, let's get into testing cannabis plant material for microbial analysis. So first off, here is a research article where some of the information was pulled from. Again, a summary here, but you can go through and uh, research this yourself if you're looking at uh, learning a little bit more about the details that were uh, presented here. We're gonna use this study to focus on the microbes, but in addition, they also talk about heavy metals and pesticides, other important tests that are mentioned on other videos on this channel. So first off, cannabis diseases. So at least 88 fungal species cause disease in cannabis, as do eight uh, pathovarieties of plant pathogenic bacteria. So there's a lot of diseases that cannabis plants can acquire. The most threatening disease of flowering tops are caused by the uh, Inquititis uh, fungi botrytis uh, scenario, typically referred to as gray mold, as we can see here, botrytis. Uh, and we also have alternaria uh, that can cause uh, issues with the plants that tend to produce kind of brown, uh, looks like little brown circles. Uh, starts using the lower leaves, can work its way up, but these are just two uh, macroscopic examples. But remember, there's also fungal species that can be microscopically involved that can still cause contamination and bad, uh, pro bad end product. So pathogenic threat to humans. Well, um, phytopathogens cannot infect humans except perhaps immunocompromised individuals. So there are some um, different types of pathogens that may not be of direct infection to humans. However, there's opportunistic infections by alternaria, as we can see here as a microscopic view, that have been reported in patients receiving chemotherapy, recent organ transplants, uh, patients, as well as people with AIDS. Also airborne canidia, which are basically spores of, of cinaria and alternaria, cause mold allergies and asthma, particularly in greenhouse workers. So don't think that you're completely immune just because that pathogen may not be a direct human uh, infection agent, uh, it can cause other potential symptoms as well. So indoor and outdoor problem when we're looking at these pathogens. It's not just an indoor grower, it's not just an outdoor grower. Aspergillus and penicillium, predominant indoors, and cladosporium, uh, predominant outdoors. So if you're growing in an indoor or an outdoor location, you may have different uh, microbes that you'd be of greater concern. But just because you're growing in one environment versus another does not mean your canvas is completely immune to the other. Cladosporium may be an emerging problem. This fungus also infests hemp mills as well. So even not growing the crop, even storing the crop, uh, can be an area where these microbes can get hold and start to proliferate. About 1% of cannabis supplies received in a Harborside Medical Cannabis Dispensary in Oakland, California were returned or basically rejected uh, to vendors because unacceptable le levels of aspergillium contamination. So this is kind of what it looks like on a kind of a zoomed in level, here's what it really looks like a zoomed in level, is canidia, these little spores that break off. It almost looks like it grows on a plate. So it doesn't look like this on the actual cannabis plant. It um, might be hard to see without proper um, uh, mi microscope technology, but 1% of the supplies received were rejected because of just this is one uh, microbial contaminant. So it is a real problem. Now the American Herbal uh, Pharmacopoeia uh, or AHP protocols here, they have theirs listed. Uh, they have based on tests of commodity for food products issued by the EPA and Food and Drug Administration, as well as assays for cannabis used in Holland. For orally consumed cannabis, the AHP recommends four tests, total yeast and mold counts, total chloroforms, uh, E. coli, and salmonella testing. In addition, they recommend uh, immunochemical methods screen for aflatoxins as well. For production to be inhaled, the stringent tests were recommended, again, total yeast, total aerobic counts, uh, bile-tolerant and gram-negative bacteria, E. coli, salmonella, and aflatoxin assays. The HP proposed some specific limits in CFU, which is California units per gram counts, but emphasized that these values do not represent the pass-fail criteria. Rather, they are recommended levels when plants are cultivated and harvested under normal circumstances. So it is important to know your ro local regulations in the sense of what do they expect you to test what levels do they set at the pass fail line this is this is just providing one example 
Looking at Colorado as another example here in 2015, Colorado did update their testing regimen, their total yeast or salmonella uh, values limited here. So this does not mean it contains no salmonella or no yeast. They just set the limit here. You need to be under this theoretical limit here. Also, there's recommendations to test for different um, for the three species of Aspergillus Asper here, although it was never implemented. So this is another thing you need to look at is what's proposed, what's implemented, and what is required. And realize that these may change from year to year, so you have to stay current with whatever testing is required by the state or agency you're looking at. Now, species detection. So, for example, with Aspergillus, it's a large genus with 250 species, and separating three specific species from the others is not easy. Due to the challenges associated with species-specific detection, Colorado changed their testing requirements again in 2016, after they had just updated them, to a 10,000 CFU per gram total yeast and mold test, but left in place the single CFU testing for E. coli and salmonella. So again, important as a consumer also to be aware of the testing, testing changes that may occur, and going back and looking at the actual analytical report to be that informed consumer is advised. Here looking at the CFUs, coliforming units, what they basically do is they grow on a plate, and we can see here they have a count, and they base that count per gram to determine whether or not it is above or below that set threshold level. Now we're also uh, looking at PCR. So this is polymerase chain reaction. This is a very specific uh, test here, very precise test. To accelerate the testing turnaround time, some labs are now using what's called quantitative uh, polymerase chain reaction, or qPCR assays, which detects DNA sequences in cannabis samples. The drawback of this method is that it's indifferent whether the material is living or non-living DNA, just testing DNA if it's present or not. To accommodate this, an enrichment step is performed where the cannabis samples are incubated overnight in TBS broth, which is just a nutrient broth, prior to the PCR detection being run. Overnight growth uh, ensures that only living organisms are measured, but raises questions of the overall preferential cultural conditions for broader total yeast and mold tests. To address this conundrum, this kind of challenge of like caught in between, some labs perform the uh, PCR test on total yeast and molds, and a positive result are confirmed with an additional test extracted 24 hours later to ensure the signal from the pre-incubated test was in fact from live organisms. So again, testing labs are trying to figure this out so that they're not giving false results, uh, not giving false positives or false negatives, providing quality results to consumers so you can trust the test results that you're able to get. And then lastly, just figured I should mention gamma radiation. We're talking about removing contaminants, microbial contaminants. Using gamma ra radiation has been used uh, to basically radi radiate microbial contaminations. However, this does remain controver controversial, and it may destroy uh, terp terpenes and does not destroy mycotoxins. Important um, note there. Mycotoxins are unaffected by gamma radiation. There was a study that was done that looked at 10,000 grays of, uh, in four cultivars for THC and CBD dominant cannabis plants. Levels of total THC and or CBD were not altered by radiation treatments in any of the cultivars tested compared to controls. They did notice some de degradation of terpenes, as kind of presented here, uh, but they compared those reductions to similar decreases arising from short-term storage in a paper bag as part of their general method of testing. So while there was decreases compared to the um, known storage conditions, they may not have been as bad as once thought. That may just be a n normal degradation during the protocol of testing process. So uh, just another option, even though controversial, figured I would mention it just to keep you an informed consumer.